we pray. Amen. So this week, we're starting a brand new series called BLESS. And BLESS is an acronym that I'm going to... Oh, did my microphone die? Oh, there it goes. Uh, it's an acronym that uh, I'm going to share towards the end of the message. So I'm going to keep you in suspense what the B and the L and the E and the S and the S stand for. Um, uh, quick thing. So this slide has just recently been updated because I don't know how to spell. If you saw this on social media this week, um, I spelled neighbor N-I-E, and that apparently is not the correct. I thought I before E comes after C, except, except, except all the exceptions that we have in our English language. But we are talking about correctly how to bless your neighbor. And BLESS is this acronym, and, and there's something about acronyms and slogans that really stick to us, like the one-liner. So I want to I test you all and how well you know some slogans, okay? So I'm going to say the slogan, and I want you to respond back with what the, the company or organization that the, the slogan is connected to, all right? So ready? Ready? ready. ready. Just do it. Good, good, very good. All right, who's wearing Nikes this morning? Anybody? Nobody? Okay, cool. Me neither. I'm wearing boots. All right, ready for the next one? All right. The quicker picker upper. Bounty. Bounty, yeah, bounty. Right, those old commercials. All right, this is, this is another one for you. Maybe this is a little bit harder because this organization, I feel like, isn't as good as with their slogans as, like, the other two that I talked about. All right, expect more, pay less. Expect more, pay less. Not pay less. You would think it would be pay less. It's not pay less. Who, wait, who said it? I heard it. Target. It's Target, right? You, I, I had to look it up because I had no idea that that was Target's slogan. So I had to throw one that was really difficult for you in there. Does anybody know that we have a slogan at Upstate Community Church? Does anybody know what it is? Can I, I have... Live intentionally. That's right. Thank you, George. It's to live intentionally. We want to help you. Our church is designed to help you and your neighbors live intentionally. We exist to help people live intentionally. In a really fancy way, when I first wrote it up, is to help people pursue intentional living in Jesus. But it's just so much easier when we say it shortly to say, we want to help you live intentionally. And the reason why we chose that statement is because we looked at what is a disciple and what does a disciple do? A disciple is one that intentionally follows Jesus. You can't follow Jesus accidentally. You can't. I've tried it. You can't. You can't live intentionally, or you can't follow Jesus by not being intentional. And, and has, does anybody remember the old Desecchi commercials of the, the man that would be like, stay thirsty, my friends, like the most, uh, the most interesting man that has ever lived? Anybody remember those commercials from way back, right? Well, Jesus, I, and I should have created this picture of Jesus being like this. Um, well, he is the most intentional man that has ever lived. There was nothing that Jesus did in his life that wasn't pre-calculated and that he saw a need in front of him and was able to establish to intentionally bring in the kingdom of God. So here's the issue when it comes to churches, and, and our church especially, is sometimes we get into this notion of we actually want to just hope that people live intentionally. And what this series is designed to do is to actually help you take the step forward to help people live intentionally. Not just hope that people come and hear about Jesus or hope that they experience Jesus where they live, work, and play, but we want to equip you during the next few weeks to be able to learn these blessed rhythms so that when you leave the doors each week, there's something that you can do to begin to pray for your neighbor or listen to them or eat with them or whatever the steps are that we talk about over the next few weeks. But I want to dig into this idea of, of blessing. As I said earlier, blessing is about divine favor, divine favor on a person or a community or a thing. That blessing is just is God smiling upon you. And that can look in a whole lot of different ways, shapes, and forms, and it does in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But we need to go all the way back in order to understand how Jesus blesses others. We need to see the beginning of the blessing, the beginning of the blessing. So we got to go back to Genesis. All right, so we're going to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, where the Lord, he comes to Abram and he says this, Lord has said to Abram, Leave your nation, your country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, 
and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So God comes to Abram, who's this man that's in his old age and has his wife named Sarai, and, and they, 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 they come together, and they're, they're just praying to be able to conceive and have a baby. And, and, and God calls out Abram in his old age to be able to go out away from the land that he grew up in, his family members, the people that he knew well, to go to this foreign land, but was a land of blessing. So Abram, he goes and he follows this. And, and in scripture, we, we call this as like theological nerds, like in seminary, they call this the, the Abrahamic blessing, right? Uh, Abrahamic is not a word because that's when I was typing it up in Microsoft Word this week, it had that little squiggly red line under it. But, but people use the Abrahamic blessing, this blessing that begins in Genesis and continues on. And there's this promise to be this father of many nations, that says, Abram, look up at the stars and count them, and that's how many descendants you will have. And this is the beginning of the blessing. But over time in the Old Testament, we see that the people of God continuously come towards God and fall away from him and come towards him and fall away from him. And this blessing is still there. So now we go to the time of Jesus. And we see that Jesus in, in the New Testament is a person that lived out these blessed rhythms and sought to be a blessing, extending the line of Abram and Abraham to the people that he's in the areas where he lives, works, and, and plays, the areas of Galilee and the, the, the Middle East where he is serving and living. So now I want to look at a story with a man named Zacchaeus. I'll talk about red little lines when you're trying to spell Zacchaeus. Man, I cannot spell that. If, you, like, if, if that were to be a test to be a pastor, man, I would have failed 15 times over uh, because Zacchaeus is a hard name to spell. But we're going to look in Luke chapter 19 if you want to open up your Bibles. And, and this is where Jesus talks about this idea of blessing from the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament, incorporating this promise of Abraham. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he became very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quickly come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He had gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, so they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For the man has shown himself to be a true son, son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Came to seek those and save those who are lost. So we see Zacchaeus is just this man on this road to Jericho. And, and, and the very beginning what does it say Jesus is doing? He's just passing by. He's traveling. He never had the intention of staying in Jericho. Like he was just passing through a town, just like you have to drive through Atlanta to get anywhere fun in the south, right? You just got, you got to go through there. You're not planning on stopping. I mean, you do stop on the highway for like hours, but that's not like the intentional stop. You're just trying to keep going. But Zacchaeus, he's a short man, and I saw some people in the back raise their hands to say, yes, amen, that's me. I've never had that issue, but I know other people do. And Zacchaeus climbs this tree, and as he gets to the top of this tree, Jesus notices him. Now, maybe he just noticed because there was this man that was climbing a tree, and that was unusual for him on the side of the road to be seeing as he's traveling through Jericho, or, or maybe it was just a, a, a divinely inspired awareness 
that Zacchaeus would be there while he was passing by that day. We don't know all the details of it, but we know that Jesus sees him. Jesus sees him in that fig tree. And he yells out to Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, come down. And what does Jesus do? I mean, this, this is the fun thing that Jesus does. He invites himself over to dinner at his house. Like he, he wasn't invited, but he invites himself over. Jesus likes to do this in the New Testament, is invite himself over to people's houses for dinner. So Zacchaeus sees this as a sign of, of this great mutual respect. Of, of Zacchaeus isn't just this other person to Jesus, but there is something special about Zacchaeus to Jesus. So the people that are watching this happen nearby Well, they go to Jesus and they say, hey, Jesus, I don't know if you know, um, but this guy, he's a bad dude. He's a bad guy. He's a chief tax collector. He's not just a tax collector like some of the other people that he's hung out with in the New Testament, but he's a chief tax collector. He's a very wealthy man because he has cheated and stolen people to be able to gain his wealth. So Zacchaeus didn't, he was, right, it's lonely at the top. He didn't have any of these friends or family support because he was responsible with taking money and taking a little bit more money than what was needed from the people in his community so that he could pass it on and pocket some of it for himself. So as the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders that are in Jericho are are complaining about this, we see Zacchaeus come down from the tree and go to Jesus and say, Jesus, if I have cheated anyone, I will pay half of my wealth to the people that I've cheated. Excuse me, about to burp there. And he continues to say, if if there has been, I've done any wrong or collected any more taxes that I needed, I will give my wealth to the poor. I will pay back anybody who has done any wrong. And Jesus looks at him and he says to him, you are a son of Abraham. Blessed are you because you are, are a son of Abraham. Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Now, what does that mean, to be a true son of Abraham? we got to look back to Genesis, right? This, this blessing that is incorporated. So by Jesus looking at Zacchaeus, this notorious tax collector, who has repented and turned his life around and said, I want to be a blessing to others. I have lived for me up until this point, Jesus, I don't want to cheat people anymore. I want to share my wealth with the poor. I want to be a blessing to other people. And Jesus responds to that by saying, you are a true son of Abraham because you have a desire not only to be blessed, but to bless others. So Jesus lives this life of calling out others to not only be blessed, but to go and to be a blessing time after time after time again. Jesus lives intentionally by blessing others. That's how he is a a follower of of who God has called him to be, not just a follower, but a leader, and how we are called to be followers of Jesus is by living intentionally because Jesus lived intentionally by blessing others. So after Jesus dies on a cross and is risen from the dead, the last thing that he speaks on earth to the disciples that are formed around him, he takes them up to the side of this mountain And says these very famous words that I'm sure that most of us in this room have heard before from Matthew 18, 18 through 20. It says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, right? The Abrahamic covenant, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. And be sure of this, I I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus gathers them together. This is right before he ascends up to heaven, right after this verse. He ascends to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. That's, That's what Jesus is doing now. But at this time, he's gathering his disciples, and these are kind of the the last words that he's going to say in this bodily form on earth, like standing right in front of them. 
And he says, go and make disciples of all nations, all nations, which is the same commandment of the Abrahamic covenant. This is the inclusion of the nations, not just the Jewish people that they thought God would come to first, but now Jesus has ushered in a kingdom that isn't just focused on the Jewish people of the time, but now extends to all the Gentiles, all those who are far from God, all those who knew nothing about Jesus or the God that Jesus serves. They're now included in this mission. They're included in this blessing to go and, and be a blessing to others. So go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, Jesus, and of the Holy Spirit, the, the Comforter. Doing those three things, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? That's what we do in baptism. And teaching them, it says to teach them to obey, but the Greek is actually a, a, a participle, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. You know, that's one of the reasons, like, we gather here for worship is to lift up our praises and to gather together and to learn how we can obey Jesus more and more and we can go out into our communities to teach others to do the same. Like if you want to know how to live intentionally, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, I mean, that's your roadmap. Go, so you can't sit here. You got to go to all nations. And all nations can be around here, but it can also be across seas and in different lands that don't know Jesus yet. But go to all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and to teach them to obey, to teach. Though what we have now is the scriptures, a New Testament of, of the teachings of Jesus and teaching them and showing them how to obey. That's, that's as easy as it gets, friends, is this roadmap for how we can be an intentional person that follows Jesus every single day. So Jesus gives this to his disciples as this commandment. And, and over the years, there's been a lot of uh, confusion and, and, and conversation about, well, who are the disciples? Like, are we considered like the apostles and, and disciples? Or was this, this just reserved for the disciples that Jesus was there with 2,000 years ago? Well, we got to look to the letters of Paul now because there's actually an inclusion to say this is the litmus test. This is the requirement for you to join in this blessing of being a child or son, or a daughter of Abraham. So this is what Paul says in uh, Galatians 3, 6 through 9. In the same way, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham, then, are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scriptures look forward to the time when God would declare to the Gentiles, remember, not just the Jewish people, but to the Gentiles to be righteous because of their faith. But God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. If you are a child of Abraham, you just have to answer this question. Do you have faith in Jesus Christ? Amen. Then you are a child of Abraham and you are included in this blessing to receive this blessing and divine favor from God, but also to be able to share that and be a blessing to others. You get to share in this. And, and Paul spells this out in this really poetic and beautiful way in this letter to the Galatians. So as we put our faith and trust in the God who blesses us to be a blessing to other people, well, now we got to get down to the brass tacks of like, how do we actually do this? So this, over the next few weeks, is going to be our roadmap. And we're going to have different resources and, and ways for you to live this out as the weeks go by. But this is the bless practices right here. The bless practices or begin with prayer. That's what B stands for. Begin with prayer. L is for listen. E is for eat. S is for serve. And another S, because it has two S's, is for share. So this is a roadmap that we're going to go through over the next few weeks and see how Jesus lived each and every single one of these practices out to be able to share Jesus with someone. When I was in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, I lived across the street from a neighbor that 
um, is, is still to this day does, does not follow Jesus. Um, but I started using this, this bless practice because I was getting frustrated with how do I share my faith with someone who's kind of against it and doesn't truly understand it and uh, thinks that like Christianity is just kind of this other thing in their lives. Uh, and, and I read this book on this bless rhythm and, and looked up some resources and I began walking through that. So I began every day, I, I have his name in, in a journal that I have in my office and, and, and I just started praying for him every single day. Just wrote his name down, started praying. And then I moved to like, a listening phase, like we, we began a relationship, like our kids uh, were about the same age, so we would connect, we would hang out in the backyard when the kids were on the swing set, and vice versa, we'd have each other over uh, for dinner, which was the next step, we would eat with one another, I was hearing his story and his pain of his past, and we would eat together in this great equalizer by being together around a table, and, and then I would serve him, one time it's his, uh, he was redoing his bathroom, and uh, his shower wasn't functioning, and the contractor wasn't doing a lot of good work, so they fired the contractor. So they went months without a shower. So we had the pleasure of blessing them by saying, hey, just come over for a couple months, and, and you can use our shower. Like, just come on over whenever you need to and use our shower. And, and that even moved on to more conversations. And then finally, I was able to share my story about what Jesus has done in my life. And it's opened up this grand curiosity in him. He's not following Jesus yet, but I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit is going to break through a hard heart at some point. But these practices aren't difficult. They just require you to take step by step by step at a time and just trust that God is going to use it. Amen. And sometimes you'll come to the end of this bless practices and, and rhythms and you feel like you're not getting anywhere. And other times you get to share that story and that person, a few weeks later, a few months later, who knows, you're, you're, you're helping baptize by taking the, the Jesus mission seriously with this command to bless others. So Upstate Community Church, my challenge to you is to move from just hoping that people in our community live intentionally in Jesus and that we as a church, we can like take this pledge to say we want to begin to actually actively help people in our community live intentionally in Jesus and find faith in Jesus. So over these next few weeks, I want to encourage you to continue to join us. If you have other friends that struggle with sharing their faith with their neighbors, with people that are around them, I encourage, them, I encourage you to invite them over the next few weeks. Next week, we're going to talk about beginning with prayer and how crucial prayer, like nothing happens without prayer. Nothing happens without prayer at the center of our faith. So I want to challenge you to move from hoping to helping, from hoping to helping, to live people, live intentionally in Jesus. Because a Jesus mission is to help people live intentionally. And he lived out those blessed practices to show us how to live on mission. Let's bow our heads. Let's spend some time in prayer as we reflect on this.